So welcome everyone, and thanks for having me here today. Um, uh, I would like to uh, put some lights on the topic of decentralized authentication as, um, as a, uh, um, I, I hope that this will set up as well your mindset about how to look on the digital space from that perspective and what actually decentralized mean because as Amit mentioned, decentralized, distributed, federated, you can put a lot of different uh, names towards it and what's the difference and why actually we call it decentralized. So uh, shortly about myself. So my name is Robert Mitwitzki. I'm a stem cell at Human Colossus Foundation. Uh, I'm head of the technology council there. I'm responsible for the technological uh, development and uh, architecture of the dynamic data economy vision, which we are building within the Human Colossus Foundation. As it was mentioned, the Human Colossus Foundation is a nonprofit um, uh, organization based in Geneva in Switzerland, uh, where we're housing not only the vision of the dynamic data economy, but as well the development and the components of dynamic data economy. So we actually actively participating in building those components and making that happen. So my background is in the software engineering. Uh, um, I was a software architect developer for many years. Uh, recent years, I was focusing on the decentralized technologies, including decentralized semantic identity and the governance. And uh, with that experience, I would like to uh, um, provide you insights into dynamic data economy at the level of this decentralized authentication. As Amit already mentioned, this is a uh, one of the presentation from the series of uh, three presentation on the decentralized semantic authentication and distributed data governance. And today we would like to focus on the on the authentication input. Um, so um, as you may remember from the previous presentation uh, from uh, the first series um, about the semantic, uh, we build it up. Um, uh, uh, model of the characteristics of each corresponding domain, trying to explain what actually we are dealing with. And obviously without having a properly named those stuff, it's really hard to try to solve the problem um, because without you know, identifying the bits and bytes of that, it's, it's hard to do. And the input domain is basically all about events, something which happened, how you can prove that something happened, how do you prove that something exists or how you prove where it comes from. And there are different activity, uh, characteristics around that um, uh, in, a, in a different flavors or different formats of that. And I would like to, to talk today about that, what that means and how actually we can achieve that. So um, from the perspective of the model, uh, which we are operating in the Human Colossus Foundation, a so-called rugby uh, model, which uh, represents the digital network model, where we distinguish it between the semantic and the inputs, uh, about the semantic you heard last week, and today about the inputs where we are dealing with the records. We're dealing with the persistent data which can describe a multiple things. And one of them is identity. Uh, as you may know, identity is just a set of data points uh, which describes who you are in the digital space, right? So now we need to discuss how actually we can get to the position that we can trust those records and how we can use them uh, to operate in the digital space. So, one of the uh, core aspects and the kind of dependency chain within what we are doing within the dynamic data economy is something which we call the accurate data pyramid, which basically shows the uh, interdependency of those layers and shows that actually the higher level cannot exist without the lower layer. And this is very important because a lot of communities are trying to build uh, different solutions and they are trying to address just one layer, for example, building governance but how they can build the governance if they cannot trust in the underlying layers about the data and the integrity of the information which is behind that and so on. So just a quickly recap on that, how we envision that. On the lower level, we are dealing just purely about deterministic objects. So we're trying to answer the questions what it is, not where it comes from, not uh, how it was created, it's just what it is. And this, uh, uh, this allows you to reason about the integrity of the information that it's persistent and is not changing, it's immutable in a sense. 
And based on that, you can create a semantic architecture, which we heard about last time. And uh, only if you have that layer, you can actually start building authenticity on top of it, which is simply trying to address a question is where does it come from? Like who created it? How this came to the existence? How I know from this inf from where this information comes from, right? And and this factual authenticity, which uh, which is the key characteristics of that layer, allows you to actually start capturing the data, start persist persist the information within the digital space. And this is obviously later on used for authentication and different mechanisms of that ecosystem. And on top of that, and only if we have those two layers, the veracity comes into uh, the game, which is about, is that true or not? Obviously the truth is very subjective and there is no, um, and uh, there is no one set of the rules in one piece of the information in one ecosystem could be true, another one could be false. So it's really about this governance, which will decide about what and how uh, we follow the rules within the given ecosystem, right? But about this one, we'll hear in the next next session. So um, starting with this uh, a few definitions. So obviously we mentioned that the main characteristic is this factual authenticity, but actually what that means, because um, one of the critical aspects of the data in the digital space is how you can prove that something uh, exists or something was created by individual person and so on. So how you can authentic information in a way that actually you can be sure that it was not corrupted, it was not temper, and um, uh, it was not modified or changed since its creations, and it leads you to the source of the information, so who actually created that, who put that into the system, and when that happened. So time stamping as well is a very important part of that aspect, but we'll talk about that later on. So, when we're speaking about decentralized authentication, um, first of all, we need to establish a couple of uh, basics from the perspective of what actually it means. So the decentralized, it's very tricky. Um, uh, it depends who you ask what means decentralized, uh, you will get a different definition. So um, just to set some frames around that, Let's agree for the purpose of that talk that the decentralized is basically a function of increase, increase of user sovereignty within the ecosystem. Because decentralized could mean that you run some multiple servers, that you have a decentralized governance, that you have uh, full control over the mechanism and activities within the digital space, but there is always some kind of dependency. So you can't uh, always have a full, independent uh, or independency uh, within the interactions, but increasing that independency defines the decentralization or decentralized system. More freedom you have or more kind of um, sovereignty you, you gain then more decentralized system is. So now the authentication. So as we mentioned, authentication is about figuring out who, where it comes from, who actually created that. and uh, and we need to speak a little bit about the basics of the trust and the relationship which we have, which we know from the real world, analog world, versus that what we're operating in the digital space. So the root of trust, which normally um, uh, appears in the human interactions, is so-called human basis of trust in person. What it means that when you speak with someone, you meet someone, you establish a relationship and you build up this relationship. And based on the effects or results of that uh, um, um, relationship build, um, building relationship, you establish a certain trust. And, and you can basically summarize it is that I know you, therefore I can trust you. More I know you, more trust I can put into you, right? But the problem with the digital basis of trust, so digital, I mean on the internet, uh, uh, in the digital space is not so easy because actually you can't really know someone who is on the other side of the screen. You can, for example, know that you're interacting with someone else's email address, but you don't know if that's a real person behind that email address or any identifier, any messenger or any chat. 
it's really hard, even on, on, on video conferences, we know from the perspective of the fake news and, uh, you know, uh, what AI can do with the video editing and stuff like that, it's really hard to get this, like, I know you, therefore I can trust you. So actually it's opposite that I can't really know you, therefore I can't really trust you. And this is why it's the biggest problem on the internet is to establish a trust relationship. So to solve that problem, we need to actually look on this um, uh, basis of trust and how to replace this human basis of trust with something which is uniquely identifiable within the digital space. So basically it's its versus bits. So its means that in the analog world, there is a limitation in how many places one person can be physics. I mean, you can't overcome those, uh, those, uh, those basic principles, time and, and, and space so far was not broken in a sense. And it's really hard to have one book in multiple places or one car in multiple places or one person in multiple places interacting with multiple uh, entities. But in a digital world, that's super easy. Duplication and uh, replication is so easy that actually you can be in one or 10 meetings in the same time and barely someone will actually notice that you are not physically present or paying attention, right? Or when you're interacting, sending out messages, you can have a bot which does that in, uh, on your behalf. So there is a lot of problems related with that. So we need to find something which is uniquely enough in the digital space, which cannot be uh, easily duplicated, cannot be easily stolen or uh, regenerated. And the only thing which we have is entropy. Entropy, in a sense, is random uh, numbers uh, so high uh, that the probability of guessing that what number is yours, it's so low that uh, that's basically impossible. And this is the basics of the cryptography. The cryptography is based on the entropy which you generate, and out of that, you're generating uh, some um, 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 elements which can be used for the cryptographical operation like signing, encryption, decry decryption, and verification, right? So we want to, to solve the problem of trust within the digital space, we want to replace the human basic of trust with the cryptographical root of trust, something which is unique enough and allows us to be uniquely uh, recognized in a digital space. So obviously having a cryptography uh, as a part of that uh, discussion, it basically boils down to, as we mentioned at the beginning, the key management. So generating a keys, public private key to actually uh, being able to have some sort of identifier, which can be uniquely linked to those public private keys, basically push out everything towards a problem of key management. Because obviously, if you lose your private key, someone is able to take over your identifier and therefore we'll get back to the situation where we, where we started with, that it will be easy to impersonate someone. So we need to make sure that this problem, the key management is properly solved. And so far, actually, a lot of um, systems and technologies which was created, they said that the key management cannot be solved uh, and based on that, there was assumption that we can't rely on the key management as a, as a basis for, uh, for those problems. And they tried to fix the problem on the internet in a different places. But actually we believe, and there uh, we have solid proofs for that, where people actually build the technologies where actually proving that the key management is solvable problem and we can do it in a way that actually user doesn't need to have very technical knowledge about that, how to do it. So it's all uh, uh, all boils down to um, uh, having um, something which uh, we called or which is called in a, in the technology which was invented for that purpose self certifying identifier, which basically it's a, a digital identifier so a set of string so string uh, sets of characters which uh, is cryptographically linked to the public private key. But it is done in a way that actually, even if you change, rotate, and 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 modify those keys later on, the identifier is uh, keeping uh, its stability. It means that it doesn't change. It means that you don't need to reintroduce yourself every time when you lose your key or will change your key or something will change in that uh, relationship. So basically, it's all about the state of that identifier and the keys which represents that key. Uh, uh, in a given point of time. 
So uh, as I mentioned, so the key management problem is nothing new. A lot of people probably uh, listening to that uh, uh, session, they are familiar with that. But just to highlight uh, a basic uh, problems which we need to deal with uh, is the generation of the keys, how to securely generate them. There is a lot of solutions on the market which everyone is actually nowadays using, not even knowing that, like TPM, trusted uh, platform modules, secure elements, secure enclaves. Simple, uh, you know, biometrics method of unlocking the phone is actually linked with the dealing with the keys which are stored in the subsystems of the of the device. Uh, but the generation is one of the simplest one. Um, I mean, simplest in comparing to to, to other aspects. But um, the way how you exchange the keys, how you actually can communicate which key uh, is yours, the public key, how you store it, how you uh, uh, split the key. So to have a multiple control over a while, uh, one identifier, how to replace the key or how you rotate the key in case of the key is compromised or how you fall back in case if the key is compromised, that someone stole your private key, how you can recover from that. So all those aspects are addressed with the, with the protocol design which uh, was introduced some time ago by um, Sam Smith, uh, which is called Key Event Receipt Infrastructure, and this is the basis technology for the uh, for this um, uh, for the key management or decentralized key management solution, which we are uh, discussing here. And obviously, those protocols, uh, the design, the procedures, how how they are connects and how they are used, is um, is the part of our development, and we're trying to. Uh, to build uh, on top of that. So from the input domain, from the perspective of dynamic data economy, there are two main principles, uh, which I think is worth to mention here. So first of all, authentic data events. So uh, how you can record a piece of information and later on, uh, you can verify the origin and uh, immutability of that uh, of that record, um, in a sense that obviously you're leveraging the mechanism of those cryptographical primitives that you can link that to the public-private key infrastructure, and then you can rely on the, those digital signatures and um, and verify those information, no matter of point of time or place or location of the data. And then verifiability of the event identifier is how to have this data provenance uh, and how to provide this historical record, how it change over time. So obviously, if you think about the identifier, which is um, sets of the data about the key state of that identifier, so specifically about managing the key, it's basically a log event, or for those who are uh, familiar with the blockchain technology, it's pretty much the same as cryptographically linked uh, pieces of information that you can verify the history of that, how it evolves and how it changes over time. And obviously that uh, allows us to create something which is called event log, which shows you how the keys are changing over time, depending on, on which identifier you're looking. But the same technology can be used to identify any history of any type of the data, not always, need, uh, not always necessarily related with uh, identification system or authentication system, but it could be simply, for example, record of data, uh, how, uh, how it describes uh, um, a specific object or, uh, or history of money flow or any other events which, uh, which we are interested to verify over time. Um, so why actually we care about decentralized authentication and those decentralized technologies, how we can uh, I mean, there's a lot of systems who actually solve those problems from the perspective of uh, centralized, federated, distributed system, and they are uh, they are somehow dealing with those um, 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 topics uh, in a different way. So obviously, the challenge is the whole data economy. So as you notice, uh, uh, operating in the digital space, more and more, you need to exchange your information with more and more actors. Uh, different entities, different organization, you on your own as well, you want to leverage the data which you're collecting in a way that actually serves you. One of the most famous example is that uh, within the current systems, that if you buy something online, 
after buying that product, you will get advertisements for the next two or three weeks, exactly about the same product which you just bought, right? And the reason for that is because systems are trying to collect enough information about your interaction and then targeting you, hoping that actually it will work somehow, right? Because they don't have a full picture of you, what you did, how you did, where you did it, because the systems are not connected enough. Some of the laws actually forbid to exchange some of the information. If you go to the uh, healthcare system, it's even uh, uh, more restrict about who and how can access information. But all those information needs to be exchanged to serve the purpose of providing services, serving the uh, the individuals in the digital space. So if you will have a method for auditing the flows of the data and allows to uh, to uh, to secure the data in a way that it doesn't depend on the one specific location, then you uh, you're able to enrich the ecosystem with the data flows, right? So what we are quite often repeating is that with this approach, what we are making is actually securing the data, not the location, which enables us a flow of the data across multiple parties, multiple jurisdictions, and multiple entities in a secure and privacy preserved way, because you can verify who is behind those information, who uh, to whom the data belongs, who is con controller of the, those information. And not only that, you can audit any interaction in any part of the ecosystem independently from any network or any uh, system provider to check that the information which you possess is in, uh, possessing about the individual user is something which you actually got in the legal way, right? So this is what we mean about this data authentication. And this is why we need to have decentralized authentication mechanism. So what I can do with the decentralized authentication? So obviously the most prominent and, 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 and um, um, uh, most important aspect is to create some kind of identifier that I can represent myself in a digital space that I can use for any interactions with anybody. And when I say that I uh, would like to have something like that, think about any entity, businesses, devices, IoT, supply chain, any use case where you can think of it, where you need to identify something. And this is uh, boils down to this um, uh, kind of conflict of uh, understanding or maybe lack of understanding of the differences between authentication, authorization, identification, and all those aspects, because in many cases, what we care about is not to authenticate someone or not to authorize someone to perform a specific action. But what we want to know is all those three in the same time means that authenticate means let someone in, uh, no matter what he is allowed to do inside uh, the place where you let him in, right? Authorization is to checking what kind of permission he has to actually perform within the location which was uh, which he enter it, right? But what actually, in many cases, what we mean is that we want to identify that person based on that who he is and not what he have. It really depends on the use case. Because normally, if you have a car and you're using the car, the car doesn't care who you are. As soon as you have a key, you're allowed to drive, right? But uh, if you are logging to the banking system, uh, the bank doesn't care if you're the person who possess login and password. No, what they care about, like who you really are. Are you the person who actually is the owner of the account? So they are thinking in a form of identification, uh, which uh, is important to understand who you are and not if you have authorization or authentication to get in, right? And, and this is something which is relatively hard in the digital space without a properly having linked data. And banks are actually nowadays using those techniques to uh, for the risk management and analyzing, for example, uh, different signals from the user who operates on the bank. And if you, for example, living in Germany and suddenly your credit card is used in Panama, they can raise an alarm and say, that's probably not him. That's probably someone stole his credit card and trying to do some fancy stuff. So they are already going in towards this identification, but not from the perspective of identifying a person to let you in or for the authentication and authorization mechanism, but basically reducing the risk of losing assets and the operation of the service. 
But more and more, we see companies actually leveraging their identification mechanism, including biometrics, uh, behavioral data, uh, uh, different aspects of your um, uh, physical presence that they want to assure that you are really you. But this is one of the aspects of this decentralized authentication, because obviously identity is sets of the data, which we can combine together as identifier, then we can attach a credential to it, we can leverage those credentials to uh, for a different mechanism. But you can do that basically for any type of the data, not only identity related topics, you could do it for uh, auditing, you could do it for uh, tracking the, uh, the changes of uh, a certain data. Uh, for example, a document which change over time and you want to identify who changed it and when. So event sourcing and so on and so forth. Uh, because of this data provenance chain, so the cryptographical link objects, it allows you to build up a zero trust platform, which, um, and zero trust, I mean that you never trust, you don't trust anybody, you always verify it, you always check if actually this chain was not broken. And because of those cryptographical uh, properties, you can assure that actually that's the case. And then you can use that for a different verifiable credential mechanism. You can use it for the authorization mechanism. You can use it for traceability and transparency uh, for the certain data sets. You could use it for something which we call legitimized human meaningful identifiers, which is basically identifier which do not have uh, um, a security properties like email address, which actually anybody can own depending on who owns the domain. But we can do it in a way with this technology, you can do it in a way that actually you can truly own that human meaningful identifier. So a string, which normally is kind of scarcity of those uh, identifiers. And you can actually prove that you're controlling that identifier uh, in, a, in a given governance. So obviously uh, we mentioned about that one of the challenge here is the key management solution, right? So how to manage the keys and how the keys can be managed in a way that it's secure because we know the history from the perspective of the PGP uh, and, and similar systems, web of, um, uh, uh, web of trust and, um, and, and similar approaches where uh, you could use those technology a long time ago, but each time when you lost the key, you needed to actually distribute or start basically from scratch. So it means that people are not equipped to deal with this kind of uh, keys and actually there was no proper mechanism to, uh, to properly handle that. So obviously average person will not dive into the details of the technology, how it works and what keys I need to have and where and stuff like that. Think about the simple example that nowadays, if you are a uh, owner of a smartphone with biometrics, fingerprint, face recognition, and stuff like that, you are really using su such a system. So it, what it means is that you have a device, uh, which uh, obviously you as a human being, you are not equipped to interact in a digital space. So you need to have something for that, right? So from that perspective, you have a hardware, which obviously cannot operate without the software. So you need to assure about that the hardware and the software is securely bind uh, in a way that actually nobody can temper it. it means that someone uh, cannot modify the software and run some malicious uh, pieces on it and so on. So nowadays, modern uh, uh, hardware is actually equipped with technologies like uh, trusted platform modules, secure enclaves, secure elements, and, 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 and similar stuff which basically what it is, is a subsystem, which is designed in a way that as soon as you put the key on it, right, there is no physical possibility to extract that or steal that key from, from that place, right? And if you have uh, a mobile device, when you're unlocking your phone with the fingerprint, what you have is the secure binding between you as a human being and the hardware, which actually stores the keys for you. So you have a biometric link towards uh, those uh, security enclaves where it actually helps you to store the key. And then this allows you to link that securely with the human being. And then the software running on that hardware gives you the possibility to have the full stack connected. And then when you're using that identifier within the digital space, you can actually use the private key securely stored on your device to uh, sign the messages or verify information or encrypt the information if needed. Right. But now uh, we said that we need to somehow manage that in a way that actually user 
will not need to worry about that because obviously I can lose my device. What's then? Do I lose my identity? Do I completely lost? Uh, do I lose all my Bitcoins, assets, and whatever is behind that? So that's that's where it comes, this concept of the trusted digital assistant. So the trusted digital assistant is basically you in the digital space. So, uh, and this is not the app or uh, uh, a mobile device or anything like that. It's basically a set of the components which could be run in the form of the agent. It could be run on your device, on your mobile, laptop, different places. It really depends on where you need that. Um, and in many cases, you will need to have a governance around that who helps you to manage that trusted digital assistant. So we are looking after the use cases where, for example, banks can offer you this kind of infrastructure, securing your keys and allowing you to interact in a digital space that in case if something happens, you can go back to them and say, hey, guys, I lost all my devices. Please recover it for me. Right. And they can help you out. How they do it? Obviously, they need to have a different checks and different methods to verify if you are really the person owning that trusted digital assistant. It could be through the biometrics. It could be through the environment signals, for example, uh, behavioral data, or it could be even information about your closest ones or different proofs which you could collect from the ecosystem which you are living, proving that you are really you, right? And um, and this this basically allows you to create these ecosystems where the people don't need to deal with the technical complexity of that system, but they still have a trust within the organization which actually doing that for them, and they can get support from them. But then you will ask like, what's the point of decentralization if we have a D bank or D organization doing that for me? The difference here is that actually this system allows you to choose who you trust. It allows you to go to one bank and tell them, sorry, guys, I don't trust you anymore. I take it. I move it somewhere else. I can move it to my government. I can move it to my local doctor. I can move it to my basement, whatever serves you without having any impact on your digital interactions and how you operate in that digital space. So if you have a completely freedom to choose where this infrastructure will be provided um, uh, to you and by whom, and you can establish this trust within that organization which helps you to do it. This gives us possibility to actually uh, create ecosystem which is completely network agnostic. There is no platform, there is no blockchain, there is no network, there is no federated or decentralized ecosystem behind that. It's truly decentralized from the perspective that you can take your toys and move to another sandbox as soon as you don't like the one which you started with. That's very important because Many systems which we saw in the space of identity and authentication system, they are assuming a certain boundaries of those identifiers and those uh, digital interactions. They are assuming a network, they are assuming a, a specific blockchain or a specific ecosystem and specific governance. And instead of trying to solve the problem on the protocol level, as it is uh, suggested by Kerry, key event receipt infrastructure, they are trying to solve that problem on the higher layers and then always hitting a limitation different source. So from that perspective, uh, this is very important to understand um, that, the, uh, th that what we mentioned at the beginning, that the decentralization of that system is basically the increase of the sovereignty of the user who can decide where to go and where he, he wants to operate, even if his governance is compromised. Imagine that you are living in a country where uh, I think good example is uh, Afghanistan from the recent history, where everything was kind of fine until the whole government was collapsed and the new government came in and the people who actually were in charge of the of this new government, they didn't like a certain people and they were actually knocking to the doors and killing those people because they have access to all the information which was collected by the previous government, right? And uh, and obviously pushing that back to the um, uh, uh, to the to the extreme, but uh, but this gives you the idea that you can't trust any government, and you need to protect yourself against those governments uh, or the governance of that ecosystem as well. And in that case, what the governance does for you is to helping out you to manage the keys, 
but they do not have a control over that identifier or over those keys. You have a mechanism to recovery. You can have you have a mechanism for the rotation. You can basically switch the governance anytime and move somewhere else without um, um, much uh, of the losses in the digital interactions which you are performing. Okay, uh, Robert, thank you so much for um, for that uh, for the insights. <laughs> on this. Um, okay, so I, I think we kind of started, to, so I have obviously a few questions, maybe I can kick it off and then we'll see if uh, anybody on, uh, on Zoom or YouTube uh, have some questions and then I can take them also. So I, so for me, I mean, I, I have two questions. One just on this authentication or kind of the key, the key principle, right? So I, I think the lens that I look at, um, and I maybe let me take a web example. So because you know, many of the programmers and software, all of us are more familiar with how it works, right? So, you know, largely we had you know passphrase or password linked authentications, right? And and I think in the last decade we have moved to what you are calling or what I would call, you know, federated credentials or federated authentication, right? We trust someone, uh, you know, it could be Google, Apple, it could be some OAuth provider, but it's basically, I trust someone else and they provide me an authentication and maybe even some authorization on what data has to be done. And as you mentioned, you know, the, the PGP key kind of stuff, public private key cryptography didn't really take off till now, which was just linked to our devices, right? So, which is what you're calling trusted computing. And the main challenge for that, as you articulated very nicely in your talk is how do I share this trusted key potential, right? So I need a sync fabric where I can, I can move these keys from one platform to another, right? And I think that's my question on how, how do you envisage that happening? So at the moment, you know, the examples that you shared on smartphones or, you know, on the web, for example, the secure enclave and all that are tied to the device. And I think, uh, at least the Apple, Google, and Microsofts of the world will create a sync fabric, which will then tie those to your account, right? But it's still tied to my account. I would still not be able to move them to, let's say, a third party, right? So what, what I'm trying to understand is, is there a possible solution where I can actually say, these are all my keys, you know, created through all these devices or all these stuff that I've used. Now I want to go to, you know, one password or some other password or some other authentication tool, or it could be my bank, or it could be, you know, whoever provides that service and say, okay, transfer it. Because as you said, at, at, at every hierarchy in the cryptographic trust, we trust something, right. you know, at the highest level. So how do you envisage solve how do you, what have you seen as kind of solutions that solve that problem? Right, so there is a complex answer for that, which is bare uh, deep into cryptography and the technology which is behind that. But uh, let's try, uh, let, let me try to answer that in a high level uh, um, um, or high level enough that we'll not lose people, but um, uh, touching on the important aspects of that. and. Very, very important thing is within that, within understanding of those technologies to change the mindset about something which we know right now from the modern internet, mm -hmm. that you go somewhere to get something, right? And based on that, from where you get it, you trust it, right? Versus much more content centric network where I don't care from where I get it. I can verify that this is exactly what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And just a quick okay. example, BitTorrent network works based on those principles. If I'm downloading a movie, I don't care from whom I'm downloading the piece of it. 
as soon as I can verify that this piece belongs to the uh, to the movie which I'm looking for, right? Mm -hmm. And and this way, like if you keep that in mind and start thinking about. Now we have identifier, right? Me in the digital space. Let's say a set of the strings which represent my digital identifier. So mm -hmm. now what, what you are interested in is to find out what is the public key behind that, right? Because right. you want to sign a message for me, right? Yeah. So now you need to go somewhere to retrieve that public key, right? Mm -hmm. So let's assume right now there is a magical box on the internet where you go and ask, what is the public key of this identifier? That you get that information and mm -hmm. on your own, you can verify that that's really true. It means that this public key is cryptographically linked with this identifier and it has not changed. That's the latest state of that key, right? Okay. So having that mechanism allows you to achieve that what we need, to go somewhere, ask for something and verify it on your own. So now the question immediately arises like, what is this something? Where I go? To whom I go, right? And this is where the magic uh, comes in. And a lot of people actually have a problem with that because it's changed a little bit way how we think about the internet, that the location doesn't matter. What it matters is the content. So what the carry introduce is, there is a lot of layers, but I will just speak about the one highest one, which uh, gives the picture of how it works. You have a network of witnesses which are basically a, a component, software components, which are run by uh, multiple entities, which mm -hmm. observe the change of the key state, right? Mm -hmm. They are not uh, uh, authoritative uh, entities to tell you what is the, the real value behind the identifier. So what is the real public key? What they, their task is just to observe what is happening in the ecosystem. If you are changing the key state because you say that you would like to rotate your key, means your public key will change, right? Basically, they keep a track of those staff and each of them is keeping track of other uh, witnesses, what they are doing. And based on that, the information propagate within the network. Right. So that's like certificate transparency that runs for similar, exactly similar concept as the certificate uh, transparency and how the certificates are linked to each other, who is issuing what, who is revoking what, and so on. It's just that because this network, as we mentioned it at the beginning, we care what it is, not where it is. Right. It doesn't matter how many people or which organization will participate in that ecosystem. Because if one organization or two organizations or half of those organi organization, uh, sorry, if 99% of the organization will try to trick you and fake the information and provide you the uh, misleading information, and only one will tell you truth, right? You'll be yeah. able to detect that something is wrong. Something is not right because everyone should be uh, telling the same thing because they are observing the reality and not that someone uh, opinion or anything like that, right? Right. So, so I think it took us 20 years to get there for certificate transparency, and we still have a lot of these certificate providers, and then we have auditors auditing them as, you know, as an infrastructure to see, and yes, it's all Merkle trees and compressed and all of that, but, but we still um, needed that, and that's for domains where there are millions of them but still probably a smaller fraction than what you are envisaging in, in a decentralized data economy, right? Like where mm -hmm. every interaction can be an identifier, right? Machine exactly. to machine, IoT to IoT. So we're really looking at an explosion of this scope and, and in terms of managing that. So do you think that'll ultimately again get verticalized in some way that we will have you know, there is a supply chain data governance and, you know, there is, you know, like the barcode IDs. Now we have some certificate for, you know, logistical stuff. And then right. we have some certificate for ad tracking or, you know, uh, you know, my identity on the web or my identity for payments. Right. So right. again, are we looking at like this decentralized but, but decentralized by different topics, because it does seem like this is gonna be much bigger than what our current experience has been so far with uh, managing the certificate transparency or key management. Right, so first of all, maybe two things. First of all, uh, maybe it's not obvious for everyone, but let's state that, that basically the security 
properties of the network, we mm -hmm. moved from securing everything to securing one thing, securing the private keys, right? Mm -hmm. Because everything which is on top of that is a zero trust platform means that of zero trust architecture, which mm -hmm. allows you to verify everything. Mm -hmm. So now we move the problem to something which is way easier to solve, which is a discoverability and availability problem. Means mm -hmm. that how you can provide this infrastructure to people, right? And obviously there is a maybe not risk, but for sure there will be a tendency that we'll have maybe a network per country or a network. Is mm -hmm. and this is wrong word. It's not a network. It's basically a set of the infrastructure, the same as you have the roads or uh, rails within your country, right? That's the base infrastructure that everyone runs on, right? Mm -hmm. And and doesn't mean that if you buy a car that you are forced to drive only in German roads or in Indian roads, right? You can take your car and move somewhere else, right? Yeah. And that's something which is worth to remember because if you have a governance, government who is running this infrastructure for people, right? right? If they are starting misbehaving or doing something crazy stuff or not allowing people to interact, someone else will bootstrap his own infrastructure or components which allows the people to move. And naturally, to this open market, we'll see the evolution of that infrastructure, which provides people those basics to, to interact. And we see here that the main role will play organization like banks, um, trust, trust for, trustworthy organization like nonprofit organization. We have plenty of them working in the digital space. Governments, obviously, uh, different institutions like insurance and stuff like that. Those guys, they will have a benefit of running trust layer on the internet because they are benefiting not from the infrastructure, but because there is no uh, uh, misuse of the data and, and, and risk of losing the information because there was no uh, um, uh, secure communication between their cu customers or their uh, participants. Okay. So Paul has shared a link for those uh, who may be watching this later on key event receipt infrastructure, which is Keri, K-E-R-I, uh, at it's Keri.1. If you want to go and check out uh, one implementation, I guess, of this or one, one way to think about this. <laughs> so I, I think my second question um, is, is immutable data, okay? And I, I, I fundamentally have one challenge with immutable data in the sense that it's immutable and it's for there ever, right? Like, you know, life is like in some way, the moment passes and it goes away, right? But now we are in this process of recording everything and transitionally mapping it and mapping the Delta to it and seeing what has changed over time and everything is immutable and forever. So there's two challenges that I feel uh, in this regard. Uh, what if we want non-immutable data? Like, like say, right to forget, or you know, maybe I, uh, we did something that we want to remove from this chain, right? Of like course. from this database of stored events. So I want to remove all that stuff, and I wanted to pass through all processing layers that will happen to it. How does that happen? Or how do you think that would have happened? Right. This, so, okay, go ahead. Then I'll ask. Yeah. So 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 there is no conflict with that, and there is a simple reason for that. Mm -hmm. Immutable doesn't mean that you cannot remove it or you cannot hide it or you cannot do something with it. It's not mm -hmm. a blockchain, it's not a network. Immutable means that if once present to me, I can be hundred percent sure that two years, 10 years from now, if I will look again on those information, it will be exactly the same, that you cannot cheat me in a way that if you say something like this video, you said this question, and if people will watch it in the future, if no one will be able to modify that video to change your question to something else, it will be exactly that thing. So what we care about is the mutability from the perspective of the liveness of that data, that it didn't change, it's temper proof, right? And if you want to remove it or take it out from the ecosystem, it's not a problem. You just erase it, right? If if uh, if you didn't share it publicly to anyone, like posting it on you know some social media and people took a copy of it and so on, then obviously it really depends on the use case which we are operating in. 
and it's only about integrity of the data and not the liveness, how long they are visible on the network. Again, it's not a blockchain. It's not that someone keep track of every single interaction and data state. Right. Because my identity is independent from your identity. We don't need to have a global consensus on that, how we establish control over this identifier, right? So that's that's important to keep in mind. So so in, in some way, we're kind of thinking about this as as a git hash or i mean i'm just to for the developers like you know i'm tagging i'm signing a git hash or a hash on the document <laughs> and uh, or hash on a record because record is the is the way you frame the events um on a record and then if it's removed i can verify the provenance and authenticity of that record and if later on even if the even if the keys are no longer used or somebody else has changed it, I just need the public key to authenticate it. And that's enough for me to say this was the provenance at that time, even exactly. point of time going back. Like exactly. I can time travel back and it would verify even though the person like my key may have changed or I may have now be signing or an organization is signing the document with a different key. I don't need to keep track of all the original keys that are there. Or... Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you know, you only need to keep track of the identifier. And then from the history of that identifier, you can figure it out which key was used to sign that specific credential document or whatever. And if it's not valid at that time, it doesn't matter. Because ah. at the time when it was issued, it was valid. And you can check with the timestamping authority mechanism that when actually that happened, when this credential was issued, and then you can recover from that. I, I always give the example for, for people uh, coming from a different fields than the digital space. Imagine that you're signing a contract with your employee, right? You make a signature and then you change your last name because, you know, you get married, you, you move somewhere else, you change your identity, whatever. Does it mean that this contract is invalidated? No. No. It's not because it was you agreeing on the on the on the ter terms and conditions of that contract. The only problem is that how you will link the old signature with your new signature or with you still, right? Correct. And obviously, in the real world, is the court, you know, the law, all that stuff is in place. Right. In the digital space, we didn't have anything like that. And the carry actually introduced this audit log of the key states, when, was, and how, and then you can trace it back according to the needs. Uh, for verification or decryption or whatever else is needed. Okay. One last question, Robert, because I think we're nearly at the end and I don't want to uh, keep you beyond that. Um, are we only talking about a particular set of data that we would do this on? Or do are we really thinking about fundamentally also, you know, rethinking our databases and architectures to support this, right? So are we talking like, can I make this work with my current SQLite or do I need a SQLite with key, key management and record management and all of that? So do I need to think differently about all of that and every infrastructure I run has to have a trusted computing environment along with it to make this possible or deep decoding. So like what are the software or the, let's say the hardware and the software implications right. for this to be adopted at scale? So first of all, yes, you need to change the way how you think about the data. Secondly, no, you don't need to change your tooling databases or any infrastructure which you're using. You, because of changing how you deal with the data, you can secure whatever you already have. So we have an example of where we're running, uh, you know, topics of supply chain, uh, IoT systems, where you know is just slightly change about how you identify a specific device, how you verify the signatures, how you establish a connection, mm -hmm. but the data is secure and then where they go, if they go to a SQL database, time series database, or you know Power BI or any analytic tool, it doesn't matter because you can just add a, additional small bits about that this is the identifier of the provenance or this is identifier of the semantic which was used where we capture it. So you're basically linking that mechanism and you're operating on the hashes. So in many cases, it boils down that you're adding just additional attribute to your database that this data record 
is linked with this identifier. How you can check it? You calculate the hash of the data and see if it didn't change, right? If you need to verify it, right? right. So th there is mindset need to be changed, but uh -huh. the tooling and the technologies which we have, they are fitting perfectly into that. What we have is just that we change the basis of the security within the digital space, and then you need to bootstrap from there, and then the, everything else will, will fit nicely. So we have a question from YouTube. Let me just pose that as like the end question for, you know, I, as you started to articulate this and, you know, maybe work with, you know, you said banks or FinTech or health and other sectors, uh, are there some kind of use cases or app case studies or applications where you might, where you've seen this uh, or you helped companies move to this or even government, I think governments can also a really big audience. So is there any pointers you would like to suggest for people to go and look for? Sure, I mean, there is a couple of examples of real implementation of that, as I mentioned, IoT supply chain, but one of the uh, most, most famous, let's say, and the most visible right now is the implementation in Glyph for the VLEI. So for those who don't know Glyph, Glyph is a Global Legal Entity Identifier Foundation established by FSB, Financial Stability Board, uh -huh. to create identifiers for the company, for the businesses. And currently there is like tens of maybe even hundreds a legal regulation forcing companies to operate under this umbrella right. because uh, they need to establish a trust. And now they are implementing exactly carry with ACDC, so authentic chain data containers, to issue something which is called VLEI, verifiable legal entity identifier, which is exactly what we just described. It's an identifier that the company can establish control over and right. they can use it to link it with a different mechanism, like you know, link it to X509 and prove that this domain is not only have a valid certificate, but it's owned actually by that company. Right? right and so on so there is a lot of consequences around that and that's i think it's a very good example to look at if you are interested how this technology is actually used uh in real world excellent well i think people can go to uh, gleif.org and there is uh, i paul has pasted a link but they have another link there on verifiable legal entity yeah i think that's that sounds of <coughs> moves it much further than in my head, you know, which was mostly uh, domain based and looking at that or personal identity to also legal identity. And, and I can see that how that could also move to, um, you know, government interactions and all of those things that we right now do. Well, um, uh, thank you so much for, um, for the lovely presentation, as well as kind of bearing with my questions uh, around this topic. Um, if you have more questions uh, for Robert, um, where should people hit you or reach you? Twitter, email, there's obviously Human Colossus Foundation page, but you know, they need to talk to you more. How can they of reach course. you? So the easiest way is to write me an email, uh, which you can should see on the screen still. Uh, robert.mitvitsky at humancolossus.org. I'm as well on a bunch of slacks and matrix uh, element and, you know, different chats. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the easiest way is the email. Uh, and uh, obviously, based on my background, I'm not very active in the social media because mm. we're trying to kind of... I did the fob. I asked Twitter. I should have asked yeah, Twitter. Debunk that stuff and, and do it in the proper way. Yeah. But uh, yeah, LinkedIn, you can find me there as well if you uh, find uh, by uh, first and last name, but email is, is okay.